Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Take your Bibles, please, and open up to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, one of my favorite chapters in Scripture. I trust it's one of yours. I like the last part of this chapter especially. We're going to find that the first part of this chapter has something for us as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Isn't the Word of God so wonderful? Oh, it's a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I remember our days in Uganda, uh, having served there for 10 years and another 15 years in South Africa. Uh, but our days in Uganda, the power was normally off. Sometimes it was on only in the daytime. <laughs> I figured that. Who needs power at night? And uh, when you got candles and, and fireplaces, that kind of a thing. So I can remember that we had a, uh, there was a toilet outside, all right? And uh, we had one inside. Don't worry about that. Uh, we, there was one outside, and I was thinking, how could you ever make it there? Well, <clears throat> you have to have a lantern. And if you have a lantern, one of those hurricane lanterns, what we use there, uh, it would light around you. And God's Word is a, a lamp unto our feet. It shows us where we are, but it's also a light unto our path. It's like putting another light right down there where you're going. <laughs> so you got a light here, you got a light there. It shows us the way, shows us where we are. God's Word does. It shows us where we're going and where we should be going. And we can correct our paths. God's Word does that for us. It's marvelous. It's marvelous. I appreciated the, uh, the song choices this morning. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ, His Son, shed for our sins, not ours only. He is the propitiation for not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Praise God. We have His Word. We have His blood that covers our sins by faith in Him. This morning, we're going to see the walk that we need to walk with in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look at verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, Furthermore, we beseech you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. We're going to be talking about a three-dimensional walk with Christ. Not one, not two, a three-dimensional walk with Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Father, as we bow before you, we'd ask you, Lord, that you'd open our hearts, our minds, our ears to the word of truth this morning. I pray that you'd open this mouth to speak right. And Lord, your Holy Spirit, who dwells within the believer, might Use your word to change our lives, not just challenge us. Lord, we beg you, change us. I beg you, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for the celebration of your birth that we celebrate every day, but especially on the 25th of December. We thank you, Lord, that you came. Thank you that you were born to die. We thank you that you've given us your word. Now use it in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. I shared this illustration before some time ago when I was a young uh, boy. <clears throat> I went to my grandfather's house in, in Kansas. We're from, originally from Kansas. Uh, don't hold that against me. Uh, they don't hold Alabama against them, okay? Uh, but I, my grandfather was a wheat farmer, and uh, he had a rocking chair by a window, and uh, he would sit in that rocking chair and look out the window and look at his crops, look at his fields out there. And behind him was a uh, file cabinet of sorts. And uh, in the bottom drawer of that file cabinet, there were toys. <laughs> and boy, that was for me. And I was just a little guy, I think 45 or 50. Anyway, uh, I was about four or five years old, I mean. Uh, four or five years old. And boy, the toys were in there. Some of those toys my dad played with when he was my age at that time, when he was a, a, a little boy. And so there was one that I pulled out that I hadn't seen before. And I said, what is this thing? And it had a little disc in it, and it had a little lever, and you look through it, and you pull the lever down, and it would turn the little circles, in, and you would see pictures in it. And uh, in those days, it, wasn't, it, it was pictures like of Europe and things like that. And he says, go ahead and, and take a look at it. And so I picked it up, and he gave me a disc, and I put it in there. It was called a viewfinder. And I looked through that viewfinder, and whoa, 
It was three-dimensional. It was, you could, because it used both eyes, and I don't know how they did it. The pictures were a little bit offset, I suppose. You could see the depth. You could, it looked like you could just touch the people there. Now, I understand these virtual reality headgear that you can buy does similar things, the same things. Hey, we did it back in the 50s, all right? Uh, no, no advantage over us. Back in the 50s, we had it. The, the viewfinder, what a marvelous thing. And you could see, you could see uh, different places in Europe, different cities, different people, different cultures. It was just amazing. It made it real. It made it like you were just there, it, it, like you were just being surrounded by it. It was real. If we're going to end this year right, and we're going to begin the next year right, proper, we need to have a walk with Christ that's three-dimensional. I think so many times we have one-dimensional believers. That is, they come to church. That's their dimension. That's it. <laughs> they come to church. Uh, perhaps they read their Bible throughout the week or not. They come to church. They pray, perhaps, before their meal. And they call that their walk with God. Oh, they'll hear the preaching and sometimes even make a move and maybe come to the altar and confess and forsake sin in their life. But for the most part, it's just their religion. They're not their relationship, but their religion. They carry their Bibles. They come to church. They do their thing. It's Sunday. Sometimes it's Wednesday or not. Sometimes it's Sunday night or not. And I'm telling you what. When I received Christ as my personal Savior, He changed my life. Amen. I wanted to be there Sunday morning. I wanted to be there Sunday school. I wanted to be there for the preaching. I wanted to be there Sunday night. I wanted to be there Wednesday night. I wanted to be out soul winning. I wanted to be telling others. I wanted to be faithful to Him. He changed my heart. He changed my life. He purchased me with His own blood. Now, I said all that to say this. There are the three dimensions that we're going to be looking at through this chapter, chapter 4. And it's all to do with our walk with Him. Again, in verse 1, how we ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. We're going to be looking at the inward walk of holiness. That's what He speaks of in these first four verses. The inward walk of holiness. Then we're going to be looking at the outward walk of harmony. Harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Harmony with God. Harmony with other believers. And then our upward walk of hope. Our holiness, our harmony, our hope. Take a look again. Verse 1 said, Furthermore, we beseech you, uh, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, as you have received us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we were given you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Our God is a holy God. Our God died on Calvary's cross because of sin. Our God lives and intercedes before us. Jesus Christ, our God, intercedes before us in heaven because we have a life that's not holy, yet redeemed. God wants us to be holy as He is holy. He wants us to have an inward walk of holiness a holy walk of faith, of faith. Turn over a few pages uh, to the book of Hebrews and notice what it says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. I want you to turn there with me. Can you do it? Hebrews eleven five. 5. Anybody have a new Bible they got for Christmas? Anybody like that? Nobody got a Bible? Oh, you got a Bible? Me too, me too. And so mine gets sticky sometimes, hard to turn the pages. I hope to change that real quick. I hope these pages get a little bit dirty from use. I don't mean... Filthy dirty, I mean just wrinkled a little bit and underlined a lot more. I've already made some, uh, some notes and some underlines already. Listen, God's word is to be digested, it's to be taken, it's to be received, it's to be believed, it's to be obeyed, it's to be shared with others. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to 
faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Are you in that place? Well, notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 5. Hebrews 11.5. Uh, you're familiar with verse 6, I know. But verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. He was translated. He was raptured. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He was taken. He was translated. That means he was here one moment and not here the next. Well, where'd he go? He was with Christ. He was in it. Why? Because he pleased God. And then the next verse says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. It doesn't stop there. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are we seekers today? Oh, I trust that we're a seeker-friendly church. Watch out. <laughs> if you're listening on the Internet, you can quote me, but understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about believers here. I'm not talking about the unbelievers. We need to be a seeker-friendly church. We, we need to be encouraging others, ourselves among us, to be seeking God with all of our heart, be trusting God with all that we have, because that pleases God. Enoch pleased God. He believed God. It was, hey... And he was translated. He was carried up. We're going to see at the end of this chapter in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, of the carrying up as well, the carrying away of the dear believers. So we need to have an inward walk of holiness before we can have an outward walk of harmony. That is getting our hearts right with God. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Why? For that all have sinned and the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord that was shared with me I've shared my testimony so many times but I'm telling you God uses our testimony and his word to encourage the lost to open the hearts I was a police officer in, in Huntsville back in the 70s and uh my partner, I was his training officer, and I was teaching in the police academy. And this young man said, Larry, if you die today, you're sure you're going to heaven. I said, you can't know that for sure. You can hope, you can wish, you can be sincere, but you can't know for sure. He says, but what does God say? And I said, I got you there. You've never heard God say anything. You can't tell me you have. He says, no, you don't understand what I said. What does God say? <laughs> well, now he got me there. I didn't know what God says. God says in 1, uh, 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, believing is receiving Him. But as many as received Him, He says in John 1, 12, as many as received Him by faith, as many as received Him as Lord, as their sacrifice, as their only payment for heaven, as the resurrected one that He promises will be resurrected as well, but as many as received Him that way, to them He gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name. Do you believe on the letters J-E-S-U-S? What does it mean to believe on his name? It doesn't mean to believe on the letters, J-E-S-U-S. -S. <laughs> it means to believe on him, who he is and what he has done and what he's doing. Yes. He is God in flesh. Yes. And this morning, if you'll receive Christ as your personal Savior by faith, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me. He will do just that. Amen. He is the God in heaven. Our walk with him is a relationship, not a religion. When I trusted Christ, my life changed. I, I never sang before, and I started singing songs. I sang them all wrong because I, I grew up coming to church as a one-dimensional uh, uh, churchgoer. I had religion, but I didn't have Christ. And so I'd come to church, and I would sing the songs, but they wouldn't mean anything to me. And I'd hear the, the preaching, but it didn't do anything for me, didn't, didn't open my heart. But my dear friends, listen, when I believed the word of God, it changed my life. When I believed that this was the word of God 
for me. Hebrews 4.2 says, The gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them, but the gospel preached did not profit them. That, was, that, was, that would be me. Did not profit me. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Believe the word of God. In here are the pages of truth that give eternal life. Would you receive him today? Would you trust him today? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the start of the walk. But it's not just a walk going to church, not just a walk uh, uh, reading the Bible, not just a walk listening to preaching. It's a walk of fellowship with the God of creation. And that's what we're talking about today. In Colossians chapter 2, if you'll, if you'll turn back just a, a, a couple of pages, if my pages will turn, in Colossians chapter 2, look what it says in verse 5. I often quote uh, verse 6. But in Colossians chapter 2, still turning, there we go. He says, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, enjoying beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now watch. As you have therefore, Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How are we to walk? We're to have a walk of holiness, but here's how it begins in verse 7. Are you there? He says in verse 7, rooted. That means the roots go deep. Right. Rooted and grounded, uh, rooted and built in him as you have been taught, uh, 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 rooted and built in him, established in the faith, faith as you've been taught, abounding therewith with thanksgiving. Hey, from tip to toe, we're to be rooted, we're to be grounded, we're to be established in our faith. We're growing. Listen, it comes by believing the word of God and receiving the word of God and obeying the word of God. Doesn't stop there. We still have to teach the word of God. We share that word with others. Let's go back to our passage again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. An inward walk of holiness. He says, be ye holy as I am holy. Listen, if we walk in the flesh, we cannot please God. That's, that's clear. Now listen to what he says in Leviticus 11. I like this. This is Old Testament. By the way, salvation in the Old Testament was looking forward to Christ, as our pastor has many times told us, looking forward to the Messiah. And the New Testament's looking backward to the Messiah. There's no difference. It wasn't that salvation by works. It's always by grace, faith in God's provision. He goes on and says in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, I am the Lord your God. You should therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be, and you shall be holy, for I am am holy. Peter was simply um, repeating that verse, quoting that verse in 1 Peter 1.16. He says, neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Yeah, it's, a, it's a holy walk of faith and it's a holy walk of purity. Back in our passage, again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 says, know you, For you know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. We are to be separate from the world. We are to be separated unto God. When God sanctifies us, uh, some use the word separation, but I think sanctification is the proper biblical word. He separates us unto himself. And he separates us unto himself for salvation and for service. God does that. It's the work of God as we say yes to him. We do have free will. We can say no anytime. Don't you do it? Don't you do it? Say yes to him as he knocks on the heart's door, as he convicts of sin. It's proof that he loves you. It's proof that he's speaking to you. Say yes to him. We have to have that holy walk, an inward walk of holiness, a walk of faith, a walk of purity. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? 
Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to him from tip to toe. We were purchased to serve him. We were purchased to be holy as he is holy. Holiness is simply apart from sin. Holiness is confessing and forsaking sin in our lives and walking. Hey, we receive his righteousness. We stand before God totally righteous the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. And that's the the position of holiness, but we have the practice of holiness that has to work out in these bodies of ours during the days of our pilgrimage here on earth. Are you practicing that? Are you striving? Are you seeking for that walk, that inward walk of holiness? Knowing him, fellowshipping with him, spending time with him, pleasing him by faith. There's nothing better than that. I tell you, when our hearts are right with God, everything is right. The world around us can be falling down, but like it is in Psalm 91, listen, armies can fail, they can fall, but we stand victorious because we're in Christ. And he's defeated death, which is the enemy. He's defeated death. We have eternal life, not when we die. We don't have eternal life when we die. We have it now when we receive Christ as Savior. Figure that one. So now that, that enemy, death, is, 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 is cast behind us. It's, it's done away with. He's victorious, and we are victorious in him. The inward walk of holiness, a walk of faith, a walk of purity, and a walk of integrity. He goes on and says in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his, defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, For he also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. You see, we have to walk a walk of integrity before him. Have you made your mind up that you're going to obey God no matter what? That's all it it comes down to. He says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Here it is, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is God in heaven who wants us to walk a holy walk, submitting ourselves to him. It's a walk of faith, a walk of purity, a walk of integrity, seeking him, pleasing him. I I like this verse in Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, 3 says, The integrity of the upright shall guide them. When we make our mind up to follow God and do right no matter what, and we won't always do that, we're still enclosed with this flesh that fails. But when we make our mind up and we determine we're going to walk with God in integrity, doing what's right, where it's right, how it's right, according to what God says, not according to how I feel or what others say, what does God say? Listen, when we have a heart of an integrity we've made our mind up we're going to give our lives as a living sacrifice unto him then it's settled he says listen to what he says again the integrity of the upright shall guide them it'll keep you from going off the rails but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them proverbs 20 verse 7 the just man walketh in his integrity integrity his children are blessed after him So, do you have that inward walk of holiness? Not just the position of holiness. That's in Christ. That's by faith. We understand that. But do you have the practice of holiness? The practice of holiness. Walking away from sin. Closing your eyes to sin. Closing your ears to sin. Closing your mind and your thoughts to sin. Seeking Him and His purity and His holiness. That's true faith, an inward walk of holiness. There's also the outward walk of harmony. And if you have that inward walk of holiness, you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Then you can also have a relationship with others that's undaunted. He says in verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And there's that that second great command, the first command is that we're to love our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our might. 
and we're to love others as ourselves, the first great commandments, the first and second ones, and here it is again, as touching brotherly love. You have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught to love, are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. You see, there is this outward walk of harmony. The outward walk of harmony. Oh, let me just turn to Psalm 133. You can turn there if you want to. It's a short psalm. I'm going to read the entire psalm. You say, Brother Nelson, come on, give us a break. You're preaching long, and now you're going to read a whole psalm. Well, Psalm 133 is an important one because it talks about our harmony with others, our harmony with believers. Psalm 133, three whole verses, hang in there. He says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Hallelujah. Here's what we can unite ourselves around. It's the word of God. His holiness. It's our relationship with him without sin. Confessing and forsaking. Walking diligently with him. Seeking him with all of our heart. You see, we can fellowship around that. I enjoy the fellowship of our church. I tell you. Those months where uh, uh, we were so distant and, and we were scattered around the auditorium and couldn't sit next to each other, couldn't shake hands, and some still don't. I understand that's fine. I understand that. I respect that. But there's nothing like the unity we have in a church, the assembly of God's people as we assemble ourselves together. And those of you watching on the, on the Internet, bless your hearts, uh, the church assembles. Amen. We want you to assemble with us. We want you to be with us. There's a, there's a dynamic there that it doesn't exist on a screen. Uh, when you're with one another and you're fellowshipping with one another. He goes on and says in verse 2, still in Psalm 33, 133, he says, It is like precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings, even life forevermore. Our unity, unity of the brethren. How are you doing with that? Jesus said in John 13, 34, he says, A new commandment give I you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you love also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have lo- love one for another. That's our God. Do you love others? Do you love the brethren? Now, there are some that are difficult to love (laughs) and some that aren't very lovely. But we're to love. We're to sacrifice ourselves for our brethren. We're to encourage our brethren. We're to help. We're not to destroy. We're not to tear down. We're to encourage. We're to build up. We're to edify. God's called us for that. He saved us for that. We are his body. This local church is the body of Christ. Now, As the body of Christ, we cannot be divided. We have to be in unity. We have an inward walk of holiness, an outward walk of harmony. Turn to to 1 John chapter 3. Could you turn over with me? 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to give you some, uh, some marks of salvation. Here's how you know if you're saved or not. By the way, the opposite of true, if you don't have these characteristics, check your salvation. Because this is the outgrowth of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He says in in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. 1 John 3, 11. Here's a test for salvation. He says, 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Didn't we just hear that? Now look what it says in verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Here's why. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Figure that. Look at verse 23. Same chapter, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 23. He says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. Now, He wants us to walk in 
love in him. Um, let me read on back to our passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Are you staying with me? You see, our three-dimensional walk is, first of all, an inward walk of holiness. Now it's an outward walk of harmony, harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You have a problem with your brother. You have a problem with your sister in Christ. Get it settled the Bible way. Come to them privately, personally. Don't share it with others. Come to them. Get it settled. Speak about it. Talk about it. Get it settled. Confess and forsake. Hey, do it God's way. That outward walk of of harmony. It's a walk of brotherly love. It's a walk of personal quietness. Notice what he says in verse 11. Verse I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, where it says here, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, that, that to do means mind your own business. If you're going to have harmony one with another, then you have to mind your own business. You can pray for one another. Now, don't spill the beans about one another when you're praying with, with somebody. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've been surprised at the things I learn about other people that I don't need to learn about other people. And sometimes it's during prayer for the other person. Someone's praying and they say, well, for, uh, Lord, forgive those sister so-and-so for doing such and such. <laughs> I didn't need to hear that. I don't need to, God needs to hear that. Be careful with that. He says that you study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we, as we commanded you and that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. Now, them that are without, I'm really not convinced which group of people he's talking about here. Since he's talking about work, and he's talking about minding your own business, maybe he's talking about those that don't have this world's goods that we give them, and that's, that's biblical. We ought to. We ought to be giving. But I think more importantly, he's talking about going to them without Christ. And if our testimony is pure and we're keeping our to our own business and we're walking in love, we're walking with holiness, we're walking with harmony, then we can walk towards those that are without Christ. We can have an influence on them. We'll have the power of God's Holy Spirit, not just residing in us, but working through us, making all the difference. Uh, Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom, watch, toward them that are without. Same, same term. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Are you ready to give an answer? I'm so sorry that the Christmas time, I mean, we're in a different suit. I normally have a, a stack of Christmas tracks in my suit. Uh, now Christmas has passed. I don't know whether to, to keep giving those out till New Year. I think I can. We got our decorations up still. <laughs> I've had so many people say, thank you for that. Here, let me give you something for Christmas. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Hey, listen, you can't go wrong by giving out the word of God. Going towards those that are without. That you may walk honestly towards them that are without. And that you may have lack of nothing. So you have the inward walk of holiness. You have the outward walk of, ho of harmony. But now we come to verse 13. My favorite you come to verse 13, we have that upward walk of hope. Of hope. What, hey, not wish. There's a difference between hope and wish. Bible hope is a certainty. We just don't know when. <laughs> That's Bible hope. A certainty. It's going to happen. Guaranteed. Cannot fail. But we simply don't know when it's going to happen. That's that hope. He says, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we do. Even so, them, which, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be 
with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Are you looking forward to his coming? Yes, Are you looking up with expectation? He is coming. Today might be the day. This hour might be the hour. This moment might be the moment. His coming is certain. It's promised. His first coming was promised. The place, the time, everything about his birth was promised. And it came to fulfillment. It came to pass just like he said it would. His second coming is also prophesied exactly how it will be. The only thing we don't know, and if someone says they do, the Bible says they don't is the timing when God comes. Not a thing has to happen. Not a, no prophecy has to be fulfilled before his believers are caught away. And when we're caught away, that's that translation. Just like Enoch, he was translated from here to there, just like that. Poof. How about you? I like this in, first, uh, in, in Titus. I'm sorry. In Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples just before he went, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Are you ready? Have you received Christ as your Savior? Do you have a relationship with Him? Listen, listen. That's an re inward relationship of holiness, that walk of holiness, an outward walk of harmony with the believers, and an upward hope, an upward walk of hope. He's coming. He's not delaying. I'm going to close with this. 2 Peter chapter 3. Get these pages to work for me. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward. I'm so glad he didn't come before 1976, because I was not saved until then. He is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for the new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, as we bow before you, we want to thank you for your word. We praise you, Lord, that you've given us an opportunity to have that inward walk of holiness, not just in position, but practice and an outward walk of harmony, Lord, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And not just those in this congregation, but those truly who know you and walk with you in truth. And Lord, we thank you for that upward walk of, of hope, of looking for your coming. I pray, Lord, those that aren't saved today, they might trust you as their Savior, receiving by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that those who have Christ as their Savior, we might walk with you in holiness, in harmony, in hope. For we pray in Jesus' name.